for uh, for what's going to follow. And uh, I think many of you you already know something of Dr. McGowan and um, the fact that uh, she's coming from uh, NY uh, from NASA Langley. So I'm not going to say anything more, but uh, other than just bring her on the stage and let her speak to you. So good morning. What an amazing entree this morning. Thank you, that was beautiful. So can you imagine where you are right now? I hope you appreciate that. You just heard an amazing violinist play an amazing song in this incredible room, right? With pictures of the earth orbiting above you. I mean, just embrace the beauty of the moment that you're in right now. There are thousands of students all across the world that will never have an opportunity to be where you are right now. So just rock that and embrace that um, this morning. So thank you for having me here. Um, I feel very blessed and honored to be in your, in your presence. Um, this morning I'm gonna talk about NASA and some of the work that we do. Um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna encourage you, I hope, and talk a little bit about exploring your future and what you're gonna do and be. I remember being your age. I'm a mom, before I'm an engineer, I have a student, um, a 14-year-old son that uh, many of you in this room are probably at that age. And um, it's really sweet. I sent my son a, a picture of yesterday's events where the press came. And I said, so, son, my day was kind of fun. The, the New York City press came. Then there was a picture, and his two-word response back to me was, dang, mama. You know? <laughs> so as far as he's concerned, I'm just mom, right? I mean, there's, there's not all the rest is just fluff. And he still has chores to do, by the way. So when your parents ask you to do chores, just remember that I ask my son to do chores as well at home, right? And stay off video games, right? You're hearing that? The, the mom and me is going to tell you stuff like that. Um, yeah, this grumbling, grumbling, right? Video games are not helping your future, right? A little bit's fine, but it's just candy. It's not the fruit. Um, today, we're going to talk about the fruit of your future and what you can do about it. Um, I want to begin by thanking Lin Yen and thanking Suzanne Klebe, who's somewhere in the back of the room. Um, these two young ladies are, have amazing vision about bringing this revival of classical culture. And if you haven't already, you will have the opportunity to study classical culture at school. And you know, this integration of not just science, but science with art and music, um, medicine, is incredible fusion. It's that beautiful left brain, right brain balance that I think is incredible. And so so, you know, as you engage in extracurricular activities, remember that that is all a part of your learning, right? I'm, I'm all about, you know, we, we like to travel as a family, we camp, we kayak, we travel all over the world together as a family because we believe that that, that whole body is, is really important. So, let's talk a little bit about NASA's journey of discovery and what we do as an agency. Many of you um, know NASA as the space agency, and that's perfectly fine, but you should know we are also the aviation industry um, organization as well. The first A in NASA, anybody know what it is? Aeronautics, that's right, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Um, and we also do Earth science, and one of our, one of the coolest, hottest solar probes ever is launching this summer. I'll tell you about it, the Parker Solar Probe. And then we'll talk about space exploration, which is of course what NASA is known about. And then transformation. You know, transformation is about us internally at NASA. What are we doing to remain competitive, to remain innovative, to remain creative? So we have to continually do things to transform our Ourselves. So, if NASA's got to do stuff to transform themselves, so do you. You're never done growing and you're never done learning, right? So always asking yourself and challenging yourself for the next step. So, let us talk about NASA's focus. And I'm going to play a quick video.
All right, a little view of what we do at the agency. Um, if you're thinking that most of this happens in one location, I just wanted to make you aware, these are all the places NASA is. Does that surprise you? Many people ask me and say, do you work in Texas at, at, at Houston? Um, I don't, I work at NASA Langley over there on the right side. Um, southeastern Virginia, near Langley Air Force Base, is where I work. Uh, NASA Langley is the agency's largest research center, about three and a half thousand employees. And uh, we conduct research in a number of different areas. I'll give you a bit of an overview later on. But um, what an amazing array of capabilities. Uh, we need every one of these facilities has um, unique um, capacities. NASA Glenn up tops our power and propulsion center, for example, in Ohio, not that far from here, Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland as well. Um, little known places like the Michoud Assembly Facility down at the bottom there and near Stennis Space Center. Um, when we create some of our launch assets from Michoud, we will move those through the water around to Cape, Cape Canaveral, believe it or not, because it's the easiest way to move some of these large, large space assets and moving them on land would just be too difficult. So NASA has literally people in many different places. We roughly have 17,000 employees across the country with many different backgrounds in science. So quick question for you, how old, which, which NASA center is the oldest? Any guesses in the audience? Who thinks? Raise your hand if you think you know which is the oldest NASA center. Raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. It's a great, good guess. You said Kennedy Space Center. It's not the, the oldest one, but it's an excellent guess. Yes, ma'am. Johnson, also a good guess. Still not our oldest. Way in the back. Yes. NASA headquarters is not the oldest, thank goodness. Um, no, but it's a great, great, great question. All right, come on, come on, come on, who's going to guess it? Yes, sir. Langley is, right answer, excellent. NASA Langley is the oldest NASA center. We call it the mother center. And any guesses how old it is now? Second trick question. How old is NASA Langley? So NASA was first NACA, N-A-C-A, and then it became NASA later on. So Langley got started very early on. Guesses, how old is NASA Langley? What do you think, sir? Yes. What's that? Oh, it's close. You're close. Who else? What do you think? Anybody else? So flights, flight started with the Wright brothers in what year? Several of you know it. So it would have been after that. Way in the back, back in the corner. Yes, you, ma'am. Oh my, you've Googled it. I'm seeing you looking at your phone. Hey, that's smart. <laughs> Got to give her credit for that one. NASA Langley is 100 years old. She was spot on the money, right? Hey, that's innovation right there, right? I love it. So yes, NASA Langley started 100 years ago. Last year we celebrated that anniversary. NASA is going to be 60 years old this coming year in 2018. Um, quite exciting. And so uh, who in here is in the movie Hidden Figures? Okay, so those of you who haven't seen it, go and see it. What an incredible inspirational story of women back in the 1960s who were originally called computers. Literally, before we had computers, there were people that were doing the math to do that. Beautiful story. Please go out and take a look at it. That was at NASA Langley, by the way, where I work today. I watched that movie like, are you kidding me? This is really where I work today? It's the same exact place? Um, there are four hidden figures. <clears throat> One of them is a, still a friend of mine, Miss Christine, Dr. Darden. The top right picture there is one of the hidden figures um, at Langley. So these are all pictures of our 100 year history. So you may be wondering, <coughs> excuse me, how I got from me, where you guys are, to standing here on stage and you know, you could be standing here in your future talking to some kids. Doesn't that sound crazy? When I was your age, it would have sounded crazy for me to be sitting here talking to people like you, by the way. Totally crazy. So how did I get here? So let me talk a little bit about um, my journey of discovery. Um, it began really with uh, my parents who came from Trinidad and Tobago. Both of my parents were born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, how many folks have family or any origins from the Caribbean in the audience? Oh, I love it. That's fantastic. You start yelling out, where, what, what countries, what islands, where are you from? I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, so you guys, you guys know what 
this is like, right? You invite your friends over who are not from the Caribbean, right? And your, your parents are eating something like chicken, right? Right, and they're chewing the bones, right? And sucking the marrow out, right? And your friends are looking at you like, what have I walked into? That was my growing up as well, by the way, right? Um, I grew up with, with curry chicken and callaloo and roti and paratha and rice and peas, right? Buljol and all these things, right? So all of you from the Caribbean, you know these, these, these dishes, right? This is how I grew up. My parents both came to the United States separately with a one-way ticket because they couldn't afford a round trip. They came with one suitcase because that's all that they owned. They came here to get an education. And uh, they both went to school at Howard University, and then my, my brother and I were um, subsequently born in that same window. So I say this to tell you that you know, my origins were humble. And even before then, you know, my, my mother's parents, my grandparents came from Grenada. They immigrated to Trinidad um, for more opportunity. My father's family is from Venezuela, which is why I'm Ana Maria Rivas McGowan. Um, my Hispanic background is from that area. Latinos and Latinas in the audience, Woo! beautiful. It's awesome. Don't ask me to speak something in Spanish, okay? I spent a month in Venezuela learning Spanish many years ago, and you know, if you don't practice it, it's gone, right? So I know enough to order my food, but that's what's really important. So you know, the town that I, I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., a really small suburb. There was but one stoplight in the suburb I grew up in. Outside of, back then, now it's a major met metropolitan, right? But back then, one humble little stoplight. I was a regular old-fashioned kid, really. I think there's this idea that somehow if you're going to end up working for NASA or some other big you know, technology place, you grew up wearing a lab coat. Um, no. Most of us are regular old kids. Elementary school, I had Barbie dolls, and a whole lot of them, actually. I had an older brother who would bug me to death. Um, still does, actually. Um, wrestled around with him. You guys fight with your siblings? Yes. Right? It never goes away. Those people grow up, and they still bug you. Right? For, yes. Never stops. For real. And uh, I love my brother, by the way. He's totally awesome. And um, I had a messy bedroom, right? Um, any messy bedrooms in the audience here? Yeah, I had, I had one of those. My parents used to tell me, can you at least trade a path to the door in case there's a fire, right? And so just, I'm just trying to just get you a picture that my life was very similar probably to yours. I played some soccer, I even did a little ballet, some cheerleading, huge extended Trinidadian family. You know, I, I had, my uncle would come to my soccer games when I was in, you know, in grade school. And you know, Caribbean people just have no filter on what they're gonna say, right? So I'm trying to play, trying to play it off like I know what I'm doing, and I would hear my Uncle George, Anna, kick the ball! Come, come, come on! Run, 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 run! And I'm like, oh my gosh, please? Really? You know? And so, um, so I, I say this to you that don't think that you have to have some silver spoon in your mouth. You got to go to some fancy private school with fancy this, that, and the others, and it takes all of that to become famous or, or successful. Not at all. The success resides within you and what you're willing to do. The decisions that you make between now and your future, that's what matters. Right now, the next 10 years of your life are gonna shape the rest of your life. You're in this beautiful crucible of middle school, high school, and then post high school, where you're gonna make some decisions that will affect the rest of your life. The initial conditions, where you start from, isn't as important as what you do with those and the decisions that you make going forward. For me, it was in middle school. You know, I lived near a large airport, near Dulles Airport, and I saw the airplanes flying above, and it was fascinating to me. I didn't know anything about flight, and I said, that's cool. You know, how, how do I, what's up, I don't even know. Like, what, what can I do with airplanes? So I began to explore that. So I'm gonna encourage you today, if you have an interest or an inspiration, to explore that. I was born, before the internet. Just let that soak into your brains for a moment, right? This was not the Flintstone era. Just want to make that clear, okay? Just wanna, so my son marvels at this. It's like, okay, sweetheart, let me just give you an idea. The iPhone was created, anybody know when? 2007, right? So when your kids are born and you tell them that you were born before the iPhone, they're going to be like, wow, man, you are so old. <laughs> right? And it's, it is no different for me, okay? So I was born before the internet, okay? I didn't have the access to information that you have in the audience. From your house or from the local library, you can explore your future. You can pick a topic area and say, huh, what are the professions, what are the careers, what are the, what are the topic areas that 
I can study and do and make money in if I were to explore this part here, right? We used to do the old school way. We would go and find people in airports and ask them, what do you do with aviation? Literally, my mom said, let's, let's roll. Let's go find some people. So I'm in ninth grade. How many ninth graders in the audience right now? Ninth graders? So several of you. I was in your grade, and a teacher said, you can pick whatever topic you want for a report, for a study, and you, you had those same opportunities. So there was this funny thing called aerospace engineering. Had to do with airplanes? I'm good. We research that. I'm curious about it anyway. I still have that report. When I completed that study, that little, in the ninth grade, I said, that's it. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to study. So I chose my profession in the ninth grade. And then all roads led to aerospace engineering. Every science fair project I had in high school was about airplanes. When I was turned 16, my birthday cake was an airplane. I got my first ride aboard an, an airplane when I, on my same 16th birthday. My parents you know, got me a flight with a, with a private pilot um, on an airplane. I spent more time studying how flight, how airplanes worked than how cars um, drove, literally. And so that's where my journey began. And so scroll forward. 25 years at NASA later, and this is kind of where I am now, a quick summary. So my bachelor's is in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Purdue University, and my master's is in aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics from Old Dominion, and PhDs in design science from Michigan. Um, in my time at NASA, I've been blessed with the opportunity to be a wind tunnel test engineer, a flight test engineer, I was a research analyst for a while, I was a project manager for about 10 years. I've also worked with the National Science Foundation and DARPA and NATO as well, and now I serve as NASA's ST for complex systems design. Um, really had an opportunity to do many different things. So when you see something like this, you're thinking, man, I never can do that. Are you kidding me? Good grief. I can barely get through Miss So-and-So's pre-calculus class, right? I know you're thinking that. <laughs> There's no way in the world, right? Can I just tell you something? AP English. Who is in AP English in this room right now? My hardest dog on class, okay? That thing nearly broke me in high school, okay? It is not that everything went well or was easy at all. I had hard classes, I stayed up late, I had reports I had to write as well. Sometimes I pounded the sand, sometimes I cried, right? Because it was just hard sometimes, okay? You know, and I had a deal, I had, I had knuckleheads in my class with me in high school that were doing nothing right, smoking, drinking, doing all kind of foolishness. I'm like, you know, got to stay away from the kids that are doing the wrong stuff, right? Had to find the kids that are doing the right thing, the people telling you the wrong thing and all kind of, that happens to everybody. It wasn't that everything was all, you know, holier than thou and there were angels singing around me the entire time. You know what I'm saying? And if the angels were there, I'm so glad that they were, right? Here on our planet Earth, I had to make some hard decisions about my future. So here's the deal. You have the opportunity to make hard decisions about your future. To choose that here are some kids over here doing some stuff that will not help my future. In fact, it will impede my future. Your choice is to go around them or to go with them. But that is your choice. And so I had to make some hard choices um, while I was growing up and to avoid some things that would be um, limiting to me. And I had to get really comfortable with overcoming challenges, real challenges, while still relentlessly pursuing the success that I saw. So I was a focused student, right? I worked really hard. I took every single science and math class my high school offered at the time, and went as far as I could. Many of them were really hard, and I had to work extra hard. When my friends sometimes were partying, I was studying. But I still went to prom, and I still went to homecoming, okay? Right? I still played music videos with my girlfriends as well, right? You had to learn all the move dance moves of the time, right? Back in my day, Michael Jackson, Prince, right? All of that, right? I personally actually played Sheila E in a lip sync contest at school back in the 80s, right? Just to tell you how old. So yes, all of these things happen. But let's talk about challenges for a minute. You know, when I was in high school, I was an honor roll student. Um, I really, my attendance was excellent. I really tried to work hard and be a focused student. Again, I knew since the ninth grade I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, right? And so in high school, and when I was a senior, I, I went to my guidance counselor and said, hey, can you, I want to go to Purdue University. It was number three in the world in aerospace engineering. I, I'm not from Indiana, right? But I had done my research, my homework, the girl in the back of the room that researched NASA's history. That's what I'm talking about, right? So I did my homework. That's where I went. So I told her this. And um, I'm so excited, right? Because I'm finally grad graduating. She looked at me and she laughed. <laughs> she 
She was like, <laughs> aerospace engineering, that, that's just, that, you know, that's just too hard. And Purdue, I mean, you, you, you're probably not going to get in. And then, you know, even if you did get in, you, you probably wouldn't finish. You know, why don't you just pick an easier major and, and go to a smaller local school? That'll be a lot better for you in the end. And she, she just, she was just literally laughing at me. And I even went to the principal and said, you know, Kate, she, she, she's not intending to send my grades to Purdue. And he said, well, I, well, I support my guidance counselor. I mean, she's just trying to help you, Anna. I mean, you, you, I appreciate that you have these goals, but you know, th these are quite lofty. And, and you know, that's, that's a big step to make. And we're just trying to, to help you out. Was that discouraging? Of course it was, right? There were no other students in my high school that I'm aware of that wanted to go into engineering. I didn't have somebody saying, yeah, go, this is awesome, this is great, except for my parents, who were behind me all the way and still are. And you know, I remember calling my mom from, from school saying, hey mom, you know, they're, they're, they're giving me a hard time about going to at Purdue and, and about sending my grades there. And uh, those of you who raised your hands having a Caribbean mama and this, this, or any kind of a mama that's quite passionate, I still remember hearing my mother's shoes pound down that hallway in the school. <laughs> Boom, mama's like, uh-huh. <laughs> right, you know what I'm talking about, right? That kind of mama, right? By the way, I am one of those mamas, I gotta tell you. Um, I had a student yesterday ask me, so Dr. McGowan, did, have you ever, like when your son screwed up, ever sort of went, you know, bad, angry, trinity mama on him? And I was like, ooh, um, I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one, right? <laughs> he would say yes, by the way. Um, and so my mom came in and we got my grades at Purdue and all of that. So, you know, and I had many other stories of other challenges I faced. And my girlfriends even told, I remember my, my close girlfriends, the same ones I was in, like in these little, you know, lip sync contests once. They were like, girl, I ain't trying to go to college. Girl, I ain't, you gotta work hard to do that. I'm not trying to do all of that. So my close girlfriends weren't encouraging me either, by the way. You know, thankfully I had a couple. And so, Really, for you to understand, it's not the lack of challenges. Each, every single one of you in this room, sit down and write down your own challenges, right? It could be your parents are your challenges. It could be your hometown, it could be your neighborhood, it could be money, it could be medical, it could be your brother, it could be who knows what it is, right? And I could give you another laundry list of my own challenges that I had to get, go over. It isn't the lack of challenges that creates success, but really your response to them. There isn't a single person that can stand on this stage, nor any other stage in the world, that wouldn't have their own personal stories of challenges they had to overcome. Just like a speed bump, you may have to slow down when you get to it, but ultimately you just roll over it and keep stepping. If you're going to come to a complete stop and go and fuss and cry over about that speed bump, that's you, right? Or you can put it in the gear and go, let's roll, let's go around that speed bump, right? And so my challenge for you is, are you going to let that challenge make you or make you better? And are you going to get beyond that for your own future? So the next video I'm going to show you is, is specifically at NASA Langley where I work. And a lot of my colleagues and friends are in this video showing the work that they do. And I want you to think about something when you're watching this. Many of them grew up just like you. Most of them did not go to some fancy private school someplace and with tons of money and tutors and everything else. They had dreams and they sat in a chair just like you when you were, when you were their age. So many of them struggled with different classes and different friends and whatever else and struggled with fitting in, right? Look, I didn't fit in, right? In many places I was, right? I, there was nobody else in the Caribbean where I was. You know, I remember my friends, I remember a friend walking by my house and my parents were blasting Trinity music and somebody said, what's that jungle music you're playing, right? I mean, so most of us don't fit in. Your job isn't to fit in, your job is to make a difference. And sometimes what is unique about you is exactly the difference you're gonna make, right? So as you watch this video, remember these people are normal human beings, most of whom started just as humble as you are, right? Listen to their stories. At NASA Langley, I work to protect astronauts from harmful space radiation, especially for the long journey to Mars. I develop inflatable heat shields for spacecraft that will allow us to reduce the cost of sending things to space and even let us land humans on Mars. 
At NASA Langley, I design inflatable habitats. I test space capsules so astronauts can land safely in the ocean. I imagine, then engineer, far out missions to explore the solar system and beyond. I analyze building blocks for new space missions, a passion I share with students to excite them about engineering. At NASA Langley, I create systems to make machines smarter so they can act independently, even in outer space. At NASA Langley, I use robots to design lightweight, energy-efficient structures for air and spacecraft. At NASA Langley, I design systems that allow small satellites to link themselves together to allow more flexible construction in space. I create new materials for aircraft and spacecraft, and some of them end up in everyday products. At NASA Langley, I build instruments that monitor and track the recovery of the ozone layer from the International Space Station. I study how accurately we need to measure clouds from satellites to get a better idea of how climate is changing. So we can make smarter and more cost-effective decisions about climate change. I measure air quality using satellites so we can all breathe easier. I fly airplanes to improve aviation technology and climate science. At NASA Langley, I crash aircraft to make them safer. I test wind tunnel models at NASA Langley to design planes that are quieter, more fuel efficient, and produce fewer emissions. At NASA Langley, I develop environmentally friendly electric aircraft that are going to transform aviation. So there's a glimpse. Glimpse. Can you imagine getting paid to drop aircraft for a living and crash them, right? Isn't that awesome, right? Or break aircraft wings? I mean, you gotta figure out when they break, right? I have understood, though, we have another school system that has just arrived, so we're gonna just have a moment, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take questions for a little bit while they filter in and get settled, and then I'll restart uh, where we are. All right, so I'll take some questions from the audience. While our, come on in. So, identify what school you're from, and uh... Should I stand or sit? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Kia. I go to Bard High School Early College, Queens Campus. And Can you my stand question... up? Oh. oh. There you are, okay. Okay. Hi. Um, throughout this presentation so far, you've mentioned a lot about pursuing our success, but I was wondering what um, success means to you and like how you choose to measure success. Ah, what a brilliant question. Excellent, well thought out. So, <clears throat> what does success mean to me? You know, to me, success is multifaceted. It isn't a singular thing. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm a mom. I mentioned my family's from Trinidad. To me, success first is making sure, I'm, I'm also a Christian, uh, I serve God, I love my family, I honor my parents, I take care of my son. Those are my highest priorities of my life, period. Once those are done, then I'm an engineer at NASA. And so to me, it's really the balance of all of those. I also need to be healthy. I, I try to exercise, eat right, and be healthy. I also try to serve in my community. I spent, uh, in, my, in the world, really, I also spent uh, two weeks in Nicaragua last summer with my son's school serving orphans. Um, and you know, we, I also, we fed the homeless during the snowstorm uh, that hit Virginia a couple in January. And we went out in the middle of the night to make sure they had a place to stay and were, and were fed. And to me, those are all of a part of success, really, is, um, is really having that balance, honestly. Um, I, last year, I also worked with the Boy Scouts and led them into the woods. I'm a wilderness backcountry camper, and that's how I keep my sanity as well. Um, and so, to me, success is, is really like a, a diamond. It's, it's multifaceted. It is really having that beautiful balance um, where you, you integrate, um, and I, I often summarize them in, into five Fs, right? And, you know, faith, 
finances? Am I, how am I spending my money? Fun? Am I having fun? My family um, you know, as well? And fitness? Am I taking care of myself in that process? So I, I define success, it might surprise you, not just about how much I can achieve at NASA. That's an incredibly important thing. But it's really how I balance the other aspects of my life as well, because I think the balance is, is, really, is really key. And you know, our, our, uh, you know Ms. Yen uh, started this morning by talking about peace, harmony, and the, the revival of classical culture. And so um, I feel a duty. I'm a citizen of the world as well. You know, how can I help create the beauty that's here in the world? I'm here because I believe it's important to educate students, right, and, and reach, reach you guys. So to me, this is a part of my success as well, as if I can help encourage even one student in their future. And so it's a long answer to your question, but uh, it, is, it is doing my very best at NASA while I balance the other priorities that are also important. Great question. Just have one more question before we get to the first start. Doesn't matter. Way in the back. Stick your hands. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. My name is Sandra, and I'm from Kappa International. <clears throat> My question is, what is one highlight that you've had since you started working at NASA, and um, what stories can you share of like hardships that you've come across? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. Um, so what hardships have I overcome and one, some stories of success? Um, man, uh, you know, I, I, I took over my very first project, major project at NASA when I was quite young, I think I was 30 when I got started. And so I remember the first meeting, you know, this was a $35 million a year project, right? And I'm young, right, did I say this? <laughs> I get to my, my first big project hall, an all hands meeting with the, all the folks in the project. So I sit in a room, kind of like this, with 100 people, Right, I climb up to the podium and look out in the sea, and in the sea of people, of the 100 people, 96 were older than me, 96, roughly speaking, were male, and roughly speaking, 96 were white. They're looking at me, I'm looking at them, and we're both going, mm-hmm, <laughs> right? How is this going to work? And so, you know, I mentioned, so was I a little nervous? Of course I was. But I was more excited than I was nervous, right? So I think the other thought that some students have is that it's all easy and you take everything like, oh, I got this, I got this. No, sometimes you're just old school scared, right? But, you know, you bring your passion to something. Passion just counts for so much and energy, right? So I was equally excited. This project was called the, the Aircraft Morphing Project. And it was, we were studying nature to be inspired by biological systems, which was incredible. We were looking at new materials and structures that had many of which had never really, really been applied to aerospace before, micro flow control and all kinds of really cool ideas. So I was really excited. And it wasn't really about what I was going to do. It was about what the people in the audience were going to do. In, the, in this audience were, were 100 people that were brilliant, right? And I saw myself as, as the project manager to really enable them to do what was incredible, right? And to, to bring together the, the bright ideas in that group. So, you know, we had tons of challenges. Trying to communicate across the different groups of people was hard because we were working with aerodynamics, fluid mechanics, materials, structural dynamics, aeroelasticity, acoustics. These are all different fields within aerospace. And trying to get all those groups to work and talk together was non-trivial, right? We had all kinds of challenges. But ultimately, patents were created. Right? Records were broken. Innovation occurred. Inspiration occurred. And a plethora of opportunities that not only bless aerospace, but many commercial entities as well also happened. And that was incredible and really, really awesome. And we'll also say that, you know, some ask me about, well, well didn't people, I mentioned my high school counselor, so didn't people doubt you? Well, sure, of course. There's always going to be people that doubt you, no matter what you look like and where you come from, right? If you are rich and successful and white and male, people will still doubt you, right? So, so it's not always that people are always out to get you at all. There are far more people that want to help you than those who are against you. And just remember that. You're going to meet one or two people, maybe more, that will come against you and doubt what you can possibly do. 
But for every one or two, there's tons more that actually support you, love you, and want you to do well. And so find those people that, that in, are inspired by what you're trying to do and want to help you get there. And so for me, really, it's surrounding myself with people that are encouraging and will help me get there while embracing and loving on those who maybe are a little, a little bit more angry and, and disgruntled, if you will. Great question. So now that our new school system is here, welcome. Good to see you. Where are you guys from again? Okay, welcome. <laughs> the first one in the back of the room. That's great. Welcome. Glad to have you here. So, um, what I'm going to talk about uh, next is exploring your future. I mentioned this at the very beginning. And I, what I want you to hear here about is exploring your future. It is easy to look at someone like me and say, well, you have something unique. I, I don't really have anything unique. I, you know, I, I, I really couldn't do what you do. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just like a little bit more humble. I don't, I don't really have all the fancy background and all of that. And, and those of you who were here early, earlier had a chance to see that my background wasn't a big old and fancy, right? Um, I want you to understand that within each one of you is something special. There are no two humans that are the same in this world. So your success that you're going to have is something that I can't do, right? I wasn't made to do what one of you are going to do. You're made to do that. That's why you're here on the planet Earth. There are so many challenges our world has, from global warming to poverty to crowding, right, and overpopulation to underpopulation, right? And on and on and on. You, you could list a number of challenges right in your neighborhood. Many of those problems are not for me to solve, they're for you to solve. So within each one of you is a gem, a beautiful and amazing gem that you bring to the table uniquely. And the person sitting next to you on your right and your left, they don't have your gem. There is something special within each one of you. Embrace that beauty. And shine that light around you to solve the problems that are right around you that you can see. Because nobody else can solve the problems that you are uniquely designed to solve. And remember, when you are trying to look at big challenges, it may seem daunting. But if you want something you've never had before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. Many folks say, well, I'm not so sure about this. It's, it's kind of new. Well, sure it's new. I mean, uh, of course, right? Don't let that be an impediment to where you might be headed. You're going to have to step out into something new. There was no aerospace engineer in my family before me, right? My father was the first in his family to come to the United States, right? He came here and didn't know anybody. Right? My mother remembers, my, my uncle Arthur was here just before my mom came on her side. She remembers landing in the New York City subway system. Now, you know, this is in the 60s. She comes from, we, both families, very, very humble. Yeah, you know, my mom tells me a story in Trinidad. She's like, you know, when, when my uncle was born, the youngest one, you know, they were so poor that my, my grandfather went to the junkyard to get the back seat of a, of a car out, and they brought it to the house, and they covered it with some material to make a couch for the extra kids. There were five kids in their family, right? And so, you know, she was the first, I mean, she was the second one to come to the United States, and she remembers landing in New York, scared, right? And all of a sudden, she's in the, can you imagine leaving the Caribbean, a little teeny Caribbean country, landing in New York, in the subway system? She was like, what in the world, right? And my Uncle Arthur had to run to class, so he said, hey, so he grabbed her the, on the metro, you know, past the people that had peed in the metro that day, right? And then, and then to his apartment, right? And his apartment was in a basement apartment, all he could afford, that was very much roach infested is all he could afford. So he leaves to go to class. She's sitting in there, she said, I just cried. What have I done? What have I done? I can't get back home now. I only bought a one-way ticket because I couldn't afford a round trip. How am I going to make it here? What am I going to do? Right? And so I say that to you is be, be courageous. Be very courageous. Right? About taking some steps into places that are kind of unknown. Be wise, but also be created. You know, and for me, I, I know so many times if I had stopped it, I can't, I would never have gotten to, well, I did. Right? So what kind of I can'ts are rolling through your head? You don't know. Maybe you might be able to do it, and you're never going to find out if you don't give it a shot, right? There's a, uh, a beautiful uh, proverb from a Scottish evangelist that's something like, you know, unless a man or woman tries to do 
you know, more than they can possibly do, they'll never know all that they can possibly do. So you have to stretch yourself to understand what you're actually capable of in the first place. You know, looking at my parents right now, basically live the American dream. They're vacationing in Florida now on their retirement with my aunt and uncle. The same uncle that was here in New York City in that roach infested ba basement apartment, they're now chilling in Florida on a condo, right? On the retirement money they saved up from working in corporate America for decades, right? And to me, that's, just, that's so honoring um, to see what they have done and then what, what I could possibly do starting from humble origins. So, Whatever negative stories you're rolling through your head, well, you know, I, I can't because of my neighborhood. I can't because my parents are poor. Well, I can't because my brother is this. I can't because my friends are this. I can't because of those. Uh, you know what? There's an I did just beyond that I can't. So just step over that speed bump and get to your I did. And then I'd love to hear your stories when you get there. So next, I want to talk a little bit about some I did's at NASA, some of the things that we're doing today within the agency. And everyone that is doing these jobs at NASA, most of them started humbly as well, just like you. There's nothing that I'm showing you up here that you can't also do if you wanted to do that. There are many, many opportunities out there. So what I want to show you next is a video about what NASA is planning on doing in 2018, this year, what are some of our plans. Okay, so what are you planning on doing in 2018? That's my world. So let's get into some of those things and I'll describe a few of those things in a bit more detail. We'll take some questions as well. Um, so unmanned airplanes, flying with piloted airplanes in the same space. Yes, that is going to happen. 
in your lifetime, right? Then you can tell your kids, I was around before there were unmanned airplanes flying around, in space, right? And so NASA is studying that right now. There's a lot of interesting challenges with that. Things like privacy and safety on flying uh, both types of aircraft in the same space. In these science fields, I mentioned earlier, NASA does Earth science. A lot of Earth science. You know, when you, before you leave your house every day, you tap into more space than you may realize. You check the weather, probably. That's coming from a satellite. GPS, maybe? Somebody in your family might use? Satellite, right? Some of you are using satellite TV, right? Right? There's more than you may realize that you are tapping into every day that is space born. So, you know, I think the news media has you know, said, well, you know, the end of the space era. Um, no. <laughs> right, right? If anything, we are launching more and more things um, into space because the opportunities are amazing. In our Earth science, we integrate everything from heliophysics, studying the sun's physics, our own Earth science, planetary science um, as well, and, and even astrophysics, and bringing those all together. And uh, there's, there's quite an amazing number of opportunities there. If you look at um, science and the, the incredible things that we're doing, this is our Earth science work. Look at some of these numbers, 104 missions that we have sent to study Earth science, and CubeSat or small satellites. Even, you know, high schools and colleges are launching CubeSats as well. We also use balloon payloads. These are balloons that go up slowly through the atmosphere so we can study what's happening in the clouds and understand. You know, when we have a major weather event and we send those hurricane hunters into the, into the, you know, into the storm, that's, that's us here at NASA. These are some of the things that we do. And so by understanding our weather, we can better prepare our world to handle major... Um, weather phenomenon. Um, over 10,000 U.S. scientists are, are funded in our research in earth science. So coming up this summer, I want you to take a, to be able to look up this summer, the Parker Solar Probe will be launched. This probe will be the closest thing ever to get to our most life-sustaining star, our sun, ever. Incredibly hot, radiation that is, that's crazy. Any guesses how fast this probe will be moving at some point. Any guess? Who wants to make a guess the speed this probe is going to be traveling at some point in its journey? I need a guess. Who, come on. Some of you guys are facing the back of the room. What's your guess? How fast? Close to what? Speed of sound? Is that what you said? Oh, light. That's a good one. I, I wish we could move this fast at the speed of light, right? I would be there with it as well. Um, great, great guess. Great guess. Speed, top speed is going to be 430,000 miles per hour in its journey. That would be equivalent to coming from roughly New York to Tokyo in one minute. To give you an idea. Yeah, it's fast. It is fast, right? And so this Parker Solar Probe is going to give us incredible pictures of the sun and its physics and understanding the sun and its physics. By the way, the solar flares are a big deal. They can impact what we do here on Earth. So as we understand the sun, we understand the Earth and its impacts on our own environment and our climate as well. And so Earth science is um, a beautiful part. One other statistic, the, the temperatures that this probe is going to be facing, two and a half thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Right? So your oven gets about 450 for, for pizza or something. 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit is the, is the, the temperature. Look at these earth science missions. We've been doing earth science for so long. Incredible. Just looking at the glimpse of these different spacecraft that we've been working with. We work with over 120 different countries in doing our earth science research. And so all of this work here helps us understand our planet in so many great um, ways. It's incredible. Other planets, Mars. What a beautiful place. Who has seen the movie The Martian here, right? Yeah, isn't that a great movie, right? I totally loved it. If you haven't seen it, please get out there and take a look. We've been on Mars. Can you guess how many years we've been on Mars? Sort of asking some NASA data. How long do you think we've been on Mars? How long? What's that? Four. Four years? It's a good guess. Longer than that. Way back in the room. Ten years? Is that what you said? We've been on Mars for 40 years. We've been on Mars for 40 years, studying Mars, right? 
And Mars is about 140 million miles away from us, right? So when we launch to, the, to Mars, it is no joke, right? And so um, we are going to be sending another probe, another uh, robot to Mars in 2020, which is around the corner for some of you. You can take a look at uh, our launches going to Mars. Uh, one of the ones, uh, if you follow the Cassini, what an incredible, this was a, one of our beautiful satellites. The Cassini had a 20-year journey. It was launched from Cape Canaveral in 1997. 20 years it's spent orbiting and looking through our solar system, in particular Saturn and its rings. In, in its last dive, it kind of went in and out of the rings of Saturn, taking the most incredible pictures we had of Saturn. And then in a very purposeful dive, at the end of its journey, it did a crash landing on the surface of Saturn. When you go online and look up some of the images from Cassini, it's just incredible. Um, it just crash landed last fall. Our next big telescope is the James Webb Space Telescope. Right now, the Hubble Space Telescope has been around for a long time, giving us incredible pictures. The James Webb will be launched soon. We're testing this now to take a look um, at how it's, if it's prepared uh, to go up. And uh, is being developed right down the street here in Maryland at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, what an incredible uh, telescope. So looking forward to what it's doing. And their picture of it being developed for testing. These are our future astronauts. This is the latest astronaut core. Can you see yourself there? Come on, right? Some of you hopefully can, right? And, you know, we get over 18,000 applicants for 12 jobs. Right? One of the interesting things about being an astronaut at NASA, you know, sure, you need to have a really strong technical background, but you know, we also look for balance. We're looking for people that do something outside of their technical work, right? That whole left, right, left brain, right brain balance. So each one of these astronauts has something else cool about them that's kind of neat. You know, they play music, they play, they, they play a sport, they do something else uh, that makes them incredible. So they, again, I keep talking about this balance, right? Um, in your life. It's really uh, incredibly important. They are going to be flying aboard our Orion space capsule and on the space launch system, the world's largest launch system ever created. Both of these are being worked on right now. We intend on putting humans on Mars in the 2030s. It's our current plan. Um, this Orion has been tested in many different ways, some flight tests as well. The space launch system engines, these engines are incredible. It is hard to imagine how large these RS-25 engines are, right? Incredible power, and this is what we're going to be using. These, these engines actually burn, some of them only burn for two minutes, just to get us through Earth's very thick atmosphere. It doesn't seem thick to us because we live in it, but to a rocket, it's very thick. And then off the Earth, the International Space Station has been around for 18 years. Can you believe that? There's been people living and working, orbiting overhead our planet for 18 years. And on aboard the space station, there's quite a bit of science that takes place there. And you can actually go online and see a lot of the work that they're doing. There's many things we can do on the space station that we can't do here. You know, without gravity, you can do very delicate science experiments where gravity would literally crush the instruments and the science you're trying to discover. So, up in the space station, there are many things we can discover that would be hard to do here. And commercializing space, commercial crew, we are working with partners like SpaceX and Boeing right, to make space commercial eventually, so you can even buy your ride into space in the future. We are aware of the incredible opportunities that the technology means for us, looking at new habitation inflatable structures, as you see right there, and our humanoid robots that are there. All of these technologies help advance uh, uh, exploration. Rick recognizing how technology drives exploration. We do a lot of funding of advanced technologies at NASA. Here's one online resource your parents will not mind you taking a look at. NASA has a lot of opportunities for you to follow what we do. NASA.gov is loaded with information. One website, your parents and teachers will say, yeah, you can look at this one. So you can follow us many different ways if you would like. 
So let's talk about your future, right, and how you can explore your future um, some more. I mentioned earlier that NASA does you know, many different aviation. We do earth science and space exploration as well, of course. And so you know, as we look at some of these different areas, I'm going to talk quickly about the future of aeronautics, our airplane part. And I have a lot of charts here. I'm going to just focus on a few of them. So looking at aeronautics. Um, this is also a cute video. This is an older video, but I think it's so fun. And this is our aeronautics effort. Aviation is such a huge part of what we do right now. Even if you don't personally fly every day, there are many things. Most of the clothes that you're wearing were not made in New York, right? They came from all over the world. The clothes that you have, the food that you eat. We have $1.6 trillion um, are of value what is flown by flight um, every year. Incredible. Uh, thus far, you know, when you look at what NASA does, these are just some pictures of the technologies NASA has on aircraft today. We have one of these for military aircraft as well as general aviation. So every single aircraft just about in the world has NASA technology on it. I'm going to give you some quick examples of what you can do with aircraft. This is the Scan Eagle, which is used to explore over the open ocean to look at fishing, overfishing, and uh, some future of flight. This is, you know, when we are preparing to do unmanned aircraft, how we explore this is we take an aircraft, like the one you see here, the Cirrus SR-22. We understand this aircraft incredibly well. We outfit it to be able to fly on its own. We put a pilot on board, we ask them not to touch the controls unless they have to as a backup. And then we can fly that aircraft unpiloted. So in fact, when folks ask us, you know, how well are you, how sure are you that this technology is going to work? We have tested it and tested it and analyzed it and simulated it and tested it again to make sure we know. You will see how we test some of these technologies in the next couple of examples. This is looking at a, a rotorcraft, helicopter type configuration that could be used in a city. Can you imagine getting to school on something like this? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, this is a future commercial aircraft. So this is a configuration that we would worked on with MIT and Aurora. This is us testing this in the wind tunnel, again, to, to make sure we understand how it might work. Another configuration, this is called a blended wing body. This is what a future commercial aircraft might look like. Imagine this pulling up to JFK or LaGuardia. Right? We've been looking at this for quite some time. This is one idea, another configuration of the same concept, and then yet another configuration. One of the interesting things about this particular aircraft is that the fuselage, the center part where people sit, also acts like a large wing, like a stingray, right, in flight. And so we do expect that this configuration will be a part of your future, and you can tell your friends, hey, I saw this before it was even really in production. Supersonic flight. Um, we've been dreaming, we, we aircraft, many aircraft fly supersonically today. 
So can we do this with commercial flight? Can you and I buy a ticket on a supersonic aircraft? We're hoping so. Um, here's a couple of configurations we've been analyzing for, for quite some time. And um, the challenge here is that the sonic boom, when you fly over land, the sonic boom hits the ground and it can literally rattle the you know, lateral windows and, and actually scare people. So can we create supersonic flight over land where you don't hear a large boom, but just maybe a thump, and it's kind of quiet. I'm gonna skip this particular video and show you the actual aircraft. This is what the, a model of a future supersonic vehicle might look like. Yes, it has a really long nose. That is to help reduce the shock wave coming off of the aircraft. So when it hits the ground, it's not so loud. So yes, we test this in the wind tunnel. We even take smoke and we pump that into the wind tunnel as well and look at how that flows over the wings to make sure we understand how it might behave and then we use oil flow visualization as well. We smear the aircraft with special oils that can help us identify how the flow is moving in every single crevice of that aircraft. This is a picture using a special camera that we have um, on the airplane. So then looking at subsonic flight, this is flight below Mach 1. You know, we appreciate that we need to go to more and more electric flight. Can we do that? Well. Our hope here, and I'll show you a quick video of, this is a future uh, more electric aircraft, uh, the X-56. Um, this is the predecessor. So as this aircraft takes off, take a look at the rotors on there. So you need a lot of lift when you first take off, so it's gonna use all of its engines to take off. That's where you need the maximum amount of lift. But once you get airborne, you don't need as many of those engines. And so what happens, these propellers, watch them fold back nice and smooth against their cowling, right? And then all we need for the rest of the flight is just the, the larger uh, tip engines that can be run electrically, which is a little bit of gas, if any at all, if technology continues to advance. So we test this idea as well in the wind tunnel to understand will it behave as planned. Here's another picture of that same wind tunnel model. And even before this step, again, we're exploring to make sure this, there's no book on any of these things, by the way. Many folks have asked me, one of my first jobs at NASA was working on thrust vectoring, and I went and asked my mentor, hey, I want to study up on this. Can I go find it somewhere? And he's like, no, no, we're writing the book. This has never been done before. We're understanding it and creating it. Many of the things I have shown you have never been done before. And our job is to explore that, understand it, then write the book for others to follow. There's no difference with this particular concept. So how we explore that? We put the early wings on a large truck and literally drove it down the runway, right? And measured how much lift would be created. Are we getting the same performance that our computer said that we would get? So we continue to explore and learn while we go. So for you, how are you going to explore and learn your world? You know, I showed you how we experiment with new ideas, right? We, we tried models and tests, etc. It is no different for you. Many of you in this room are already inspired by something. I hear students all the time telling me, I don't know what I want to do, I don't know what I want to be, right? I don't have any ideas, and they're waiting for it to just fall out of the sky someplace, right? I'm just waiting to be inspired. And, and that's okay. But you have to connect your inspiration with preparation, right? If you have a kernel of an idea, you like animals, you like fashion, you like movies, you like cinema, you have the access to the internet full of information where you can explore that idea some more and say, what are the opportunities in this area? Most students spend more time planning for prom than their future. Most students spend more time on a video game than planning their future. Then they wonder why, well, I don't know what I could possibly do. Like, what, what have you done about that? How are you exploring your world? So let me put a challenge out there to you. For every hour you spend on a video game, are you willing to invest in your future? Right? The decisions you make in the next 10 years will change the rest of your life. You have the opportunity to connect that in your inspiration with some preparation. And as you do that, like for me, I was inspired by aircraft, did a little bit of preparation and explored that a little bit more. And then I learned, oh, here's this opportunity. So then I got some more inspiration about, oh, engineering, more preparation. And so this loop goes back and forth. 
So take the time, you have it now, right? Where you can understand what your future can be. And many folks say, well, I don't want to regiment my life too much. This is not about regimenting your life. If you fail to have a plan, then you plan to fail. Literally, right? I want you to think about it. I have lots of images at the bottom there. You know, how many people are in sports here? A lot of you. Let me ask you a question. Before you get on the field or the court or whatever you play on, does your coach have an idea of what they would like you to do? Or are you just running around loose? You have no idea where there's no positions, right? There's no skills. There's no preparation. You're just going to go out there and do whatever you want to do. You can run in circles and do a little twirl, just like this in the field. And it's all going to come out just fine. Is that going to work well for you? No. Those of you who are musicians, right, and artists, you're just going to roll up on stage and go, nah, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to wait for inspiration to fall out of the sky. No, of course not. If you wouldn't do it for your next soccer game, why are you doing it for your future? Right? If you wouldn't do this to create your next work of art, why would you leave your future less planned and thought through? So take the moment, take some time, go to the internet with an adult that can help you and explore the things that are of interest to you and see what can I get paid to do based on what I'm interested in, right? If even you took 15, 20% of the time you spend on video games and preparing for the next awesome fun time you have and put it into your future, it would change your future in ways that'll be incredible. Folks tell me sometimes, well, I just need a lucky break, right? I hear, you know, if, if other folks are lucky, I'm just not lucky. You know, that, that's really what it is. Uh, my life is just so rough. Let me tell you something, you know what luck is? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. If the opportunity comes along and you are unprepared for it, it doesn't matter how awesome that opportunity is if you are unprepared to take advantage of it, right? I remember my freshman year in college, um, I, I came home um, after the first semester and my mom made me get, an inter get a resume, get a business suit, prepare for interviewing. I didn't want to do any of that mess, right? But my mother made me do it, right? And made me get ready. I mean, the last thing I wanted to do, I just wanted to take a break. I'm so thankful she did. You know, about a month later, NASA was interviewing at Purdue where I did my undergraduate, right? And I, and I was like, wow, I would love to do this. I mean, I, I, how can I do this, right? You know, long story made short, I ended up getting an interview with the NASA person there, literally on their lunch hour. They were fully booked. And by the grace of God, I was able to get it in that interview at the last moment, during his last window he had. I ran back to my dorm. I grabbed my business suit that my mom made me get. I grabbed my resume. I had already done preparatory interviewing with my mom and my dad at my house, getting ready. I was so ready for that interview when it came about. Right? What if I hadn't been prepared, but I had been, quote, lucky? Right? Not at all. So, how are you going to prepare for your future? What are you going to do this weekend to get started? If you took an hour every Saturday of your life and say, I'm going to explore what my future could possibly be, you might just change your future. And remember what I said earlier, if I had stopped at I can't, I would never ever have gotten to I did. It wasn't that it was always easy, in fact, for me at all. You know, freshman year was hard in engineering at Purdue. I think I cried once a week honestly, right? Um, it was really hard. And I had to learn new ways of studying that I had not developed in high school. Um, and so I had to step through that as well. I had to mop up the tears and say, all right, and they get back in the game. Those of you who are in sports, right? I mean, you have days where it doesn't go that well, right? You get kicked, you get hit, right? And it's not fun and it's not great, right? And you get back in the game, right? So stretching beyond where you can go, and I want to I close on this one idea about innovation. Innovation often occurs at the boundaries of different concepts and ideas of people. So every one of you is unique and different in here. And if you're thinking about, you know, well, you know, I, I'm not like other veterinarians. I'm not like, when I go online and I look at all the people who are veterinarians, who are musicians, who are, uh, you know, biologists. I, I don't look like them, so I'm not sure if I can do that. Are you kidding me? Do you think I look like anybody <laughs> that I'm working with, right? That, your uniqueness may be the very thing that helps you create what is new. 
And a new idea often comes from someone who has not looked at the same problem. You know, one of the fun stories I love to share about NASA's history, you know, the space shuttle, when it was first being created, most aircraft are made out of metal. Particularly historically, we're changing that slowly, but historically most aircraft are made out of metal. <clears throat> There's a story of a bunch of NASA engineers trying to figure out how can we make the space shuttle out of metal and safely have it go through all these massive temperature shifts, incredibly hot and incredibly cold where it's going to expand and shrink. How can we possibly do this? Somebody that was not really familiar with building aircraft as much in the back of the room said, hey, why does it have to be metal? And the, you know, the experts turn around and say, well, that's crazy, man, that's stupid. I mean, aircraft are, of course, made out of metal. Who are you and why would you even suggest that? And somebody else said, well, well wait a minute now. They have kind of a good point. Well, what else could we do that's possible? That conversation inspired NASA to say, well, we can still make the main body out of metal, but then we can use tiles, these high temperature tiles that fit like a jigsaw puzzle on the outside of the metal that would protect the space shuttle as it's coming in for a landing. So your uniqueness, your different perspective may be just the thing that inspires some breakthrough in medicine, some breakthrough in human trafficking, some breakthrough in overcrowded cities, some breakthrough in education. So who you are is amazing and it's beautiful no matter where you've come from, right? And so remember to embrace what you can possibly do and explore your own future. Put energy into what you could do in your future. I want to say one last thing before I close. Thank you, Lin Yen. Thank you, Suzanne Klebe and the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Music. They are the ones. They had the crazy idea of calling a NASA scientist to come talk to you today. They stepped outside their own box, right? So can we give a hand clap to these guys over here? Thank you, Dr. McGowan. Uh, we're going to take one question actually from Bronx Law first, and then someone from our foundation has something to say to all of you because uh, Bronx Law has to leave a little bit early. So uh, who at Bronx Law has a question? I did believe. Yeah? There we go. Speak up. Oh, forget it, forget it, forget it, forget it. Go on. Go on. Oh, Crystal. Crystal has questions. Yeah. No. All right, so please stand up. Tell me your name and what school you're coming from. Um, good morning to everybody. Um, morning. I have a question, which is, do you believe society has accepted women in technology, math, and science world? Say that one more time, hon. Do you believe society has accepted women in the technology, math, and science world? Yes. Um, how come? <laughs> I'm standing here. Right? right. You know, one of NASA's associate administrators is a female. You know, we, we have many women. Yes, there is no question. I mean, your, your question's a really good one, right? I, I answered it very briefly. Um, you know, it's only about 10% women in engineering today, and that, that's an awfully small number. Part of it's mindset. You know, I hear parents tell me crazy things like, well, my daughter likes math. Isn't that crazy? I'm like, uh, no. One of the reasons that I, I love what I do is that it's leveling. It doesn't matter what background you have. Intellect is what's necessary here. And intellect knows no demographic boundaries. The brain of somebody that's coming from a sm poor, small town is just as capable as the brain of somebody coming from a rich, wealthy, large town. Right? The human brain is just as capable no matter where you have come from at all. I keep meaning preparation, so if you prepare your mind to succeed, you can start from any, lo any place. Your mind can achieve so much more than you can even imagine. So if you're willing to apply yourself, you can do amazing things. Now, do some people have difficulties accepting those who are different than them into their world? Sure, that would be their problem. <laughs> Right? Your job is to be competent, because competence speaks. And if you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, right, those ladies were incredibly competent. And once you are competent, people will love to welcome you into what you're doing. You're always going to have people that, that don't believe in what you can do, no matter who you are. Right? But there are far more that are for your success. 
than are against you, and that's definitely been the case in my career. Are there some challenges? Sure. But are there some opportunities? Oh, yeah. Great question. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce Jose, who's going to talk a little bit about the summer school they have, and then I will take some more questions after that. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. McGowan. <clears throat> My name is Jose Vega, as Dr. McGowan said. Um, I was a student of the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Culture in 2013, and I haven't stopped working with them since. This summer, we are starting something called Freedom Summer. I believe Dr. McGowan earlier in her presentation said that it is not challenges that define you, but how you overcome these challenges. Everyone in this room has a challenge right now, and it is your current society and your culture. You have a violent culture. Does anyone disagree with me? No. Of course you have a violent culture. Look what happened uh, a, few, a few weeks ago at uh, Florida. Look what's going to keep happening. The opposite of violence is creative thought because that's the absence of violence. I got three things to touch upon. One, April 9th, Bernard Lafayette will be at our concert. Uh, happen we have a little leaflets, by the way. You don't have to squint your eyes. On April 9th, we will be having a concert at St. Bartholomew's Church. Bernard Lafayette, with a group of other students in their late teens and early 20s, started the Students for Nonviolent, Students of Nonviolent Coordinate Committee, something like that. They started a nonviolent movement, and they were in their late teens and early 20s, meaning everyone in this room has the capacity to do just that. And he will be there. And our concert is honoring the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King. So you must be there. There's more information in the back on that. Number two, our summer program. Our summer program is a five-week intensive course. It's four days a week, starts mid-July, late August. The summer program will touch upon some of the things that Dr. McGowan talked about today. Every day is a new experience. I don't regret doing it, and I think everyone here should. And the third most important thing here, if you want and you demand a safe, productive, creative school, you must demand it with your voice. And I need at least a thousand students just from the Bronx to demand it. I spoke with Dr. McGowan recently, yesterday actually, and she told me that the NASA education budget was cut completely. Who here thinks that's a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Of course it is. Wouldn't you want it back? You need a thousand students to demand that they want it back, and you need a thousand students to demand that they want a safe, productive, creative school. But how are you going to do that? That's where the Students for Creative Society comes in, and that's what Freedom Summer is about. We have more information in the back on the summer program, and you can talk to me, and you can talk to Ms. Yen, you can talk to Suzanne Klebe in the back about it. But everyone here in this room plays a significant role in making your culture better and making your society better. Our current society is a modern society, but we're called the foundation for the revival of classical culture. Not a violent culture, a classical culture. And that's where everyone in this room fits. It is your job to bring it back to a classical culture and move it forward. And so with that, I'm gonna bring it back to Dr. McGowan. Thank you. All right, we have one school system that's leaving right now, but I can then use a question. I'll try to hit this side of the room before they all have to empty out. Thank you for being here this morning. Take care. It's good seeing you guys. Yeah, there's like one question over there, Jose. There's one quick question. Can you get the gentleman right there in the tie? And I'll take some more questions from the rest of you who are allowed to remain. Good morning, and thank good you. Morning. I just have a quick question. Um, what roles did mentors play in developing your future progress? I've heard about your challenges, but who were those angels, so to speak, that spoke into life and got you moving in your, your, your trajectory? Oh, amen, what a great question. So my first angels were my parents. There's no question about it. They are amazing, they still are amazing. They believed in me. You know what, when I first said I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, they didn't even blink. It was like I had said I wanted to tie my shoes. They were like, okay, all right. What are we gonna do about that? Let's get rolling, right? 
So the question that the young lady asked earlier about, you know, are women accepted? You know what? They accepted me, and their complete matter of fact, of course you're going to be an aerospace engineer, of course. So important. You know, later on in my career, the first person that, that, that hired me into a management position, Dr. Daryl Tenney. Um, uh, gave me, you know, he so believed in me and what I could create. You know, he's a senior Caucasian fellow from West Virginia. I mean, all these stereotypes that all of us have in our head. I say that and many of you are thinking, oh God, he's not going to be supportive. He was totally supportive, right? There were so many senior Caucasian men that completely supported me, backed me up, encouraged me, cheered me on, and I am so thankful for them. You know? And so yes, I've had many mentors that have come along beside me, in front of me, behind me, even to some of my colleagues, you know, when you get discouraged, that, want, that say, hey, I know this is hard. You know, I, I had a, um, my first aircraft that I was testing was crashed in 1996. It was a $2 million high-speed civil transport aircraft. I was a co-test lead with another gentleman. We had a test team of 10 people in the wind tunnel um, control room in about less than a second, that beautiful aircraft model was in splinters. And I felt like my gut just dropped into my, you know, my, my shoes, literally. I'm like, oh my gosh. And you know, I'll never forget, my boss at the time, also a senior Caucasian male, right? Just gonna say. He came and he, he, he put his arms around me and he said, Anna, this will make you a better engineer. You will learn much from this. He in no way said, oh, you're a failure, I can't believe you screwed this up at all. I'll never forget that. Him just saying, you can, this is Dr. Tom, Mr. Dr. Tom Knoll, he's now deceased, but just in his honor, he, he said, you know, this will make you a better person, and he was so right. I learned, and then subsequent to that, I kept taking on larger and larger aircraft programs. I mean, so just having people believe in me, even when things didn't go exactly right, was awesome. Right? So yes, mentors are huge. Sometimes you have to seek them out and ask for them. So I would encourage you as well. There are mentors all around you. There are teachers, counselors, librarians, doctors, nurses, attorneys, people in your church and in your community that want to help you. And don't be afraid to ask for just that. What a great question. Thank you. There's a young lady in the way back that's impatiently raising your hand. You, yes. What is your question? You can yell it out as loud as you can. Where are you? Right there. The beautiful pink scarf. Pink scarf. Yes. Come on, beautiful pink scarf. Great question about mentors. I'm from Kappa Three School. Fantastic. Thank you. Actually, I actually have like a idea and a question. Okay. My idea is why don't NASA create models so they can line up a plan to go to space or the sun, etc. And my question is, have you ever dealt with bullying or people who like continuously picked on you or call you names, etc.? Oh yeah. So let me touch your idea first. Your idea of models is perfect. This is what the experts do, is they build models so we can understand. We build a model for every single idea that NASA has. We build a computer model. We usually build physical models of it as well. Um, we crash land, we wind tunnel test, we test it with heat, we test it with vibration. We have an entire facility that tests for the durability of something. That literally will just shake something over and over and over and over and over and over again, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to see will it last um, from a durability perspective. So yes, models are an incredibly important part of what we do, incredibly insightful. You have the mentality mentality and the idea of NASA rocket scientists. What a beautiful idea. Your second question about bullying. Who has not had a bully in your life? Anybody who never had one? Why well, see one hand, maybe two. Not many, right? So most people have had it, me too, yes. People who just, that bother you. Yes, of course I have had that. Um, I've said this before, you know, there are more that are for you than against you. 
And, uh, you know, not letting your bullies or those who are against you define you is really important. Remember who you are and what you are capable of. They're going to try to tell you some negative thoughts about things and just not letting that be who you are. You know, one of the blessings that I didn't realize I had that came from my, my own culture and history from, from the Caribbean. In Trinidad, you know, it's a very multicultural culture, but everybody's brown skin, right? You're, you're, you're either black, you're Latino, you're East Indian, and many different cultures, but everybody's brown skin. I say that because every single profession in Trinidad is done by people who are brown skin. If you're a surgeon, if you're a dentist, if you're an engineer, if you're a scientist, if you're a politician, you're all brown skin. So it, in my head, my color had nothing to do with me having any impediments to my future as an engineer. Never, never connected my, cult, my, my, cult, my color rather, with limitations of my future at all. Did other people connect those dots? Did they mention that? Like, well, I don't know, Anna. There aren't many people that are like you in that profession. Like, well, I'll just be the first. I've never seen a black female aerospace engineer, and I'm like, well, you're, you're looking at one, right? So I'm, I'm happy to be your first example, and I'm sorry you don't have that vision, but that's not my vision. So my biggest advice is do not let your bullies define who you are. That is more their problem and their wrong thinking, and it needn't be yours. Yes, ma'am. Great question. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Naisha. I'm from the Academy of Mount St. Ursula. Um, my question is, how did you utilize your time in college to set the foundation for your career, especially pertaining to like internships and like networking, research Fantastic. opportunities? Great question. Fantastic. How did I use my time in college to get ready? Great, great question. A lot of high school folks here. How many folks here are in high school? A lot of you that are remaining. Excellent, excellent. It's an incredibly important question. Um, so first, I worked my butt off in college, let me just say, right? It's a lot of work, but it's so, so, so valuable. So, um, in, in, so you have your academic work in college, which of course you need to do really well on, right? And get the help that you need. Um, extracurriculars are kind of a big deal. So I began to work at NASA as, an, as a co-op student when I was just a sophomore. So there are many internship opportunities and, and up to work in the career field that you're interested in. If you want to be an attorney, if you want to be a politician, if you want to be a scientist, there are many places that will hire you for short durations of times, either a semester or a summer, to work with them. This helps you kind of figure out what part of your future you would like. I mentioned before exploring your future. This helped me. For example, when I first wanted to work at NASA, I thought I wanted to work in aerodynamics, right? Because that's, that's what I understood at the time. My first co-op session was in the world of aerodynamics, and I said, this is kind of cool, but it's not exactly what I wanted to do. So I had five different internship sem semesters with NASA before I graduated. Each one was so valuable because what I was doing, I was exploring my future piece by piece. I finally got to one. I, in structure, structural dynamics, which is where I ended up, my career ended up focusing on, the class that I had on that topic was boring. Teacher was boring, wah, wah, right? I was like, I don't want to do this for a living. But when I had a chance to see that topic area in action, I was working in a space station model, I was like, this is awesome. This is what I want to do for my future, right? So yes, take advantage of internships as early as you possibly can when you're in college. Second thing, extracurricular, crazy important. Balance is important. You know, you can be really smart academically, but not know how to work with people. You can be smart academically, but not know how to communicate. You can be smart academically, but not know how to handle challenges and solve problems, right? And so, outside of my coursework, I was actively involved in the National Society of Black Engineers and the Society of Women Engineers. I took leadership roles in both organizations that were really tough, actually, and I learned how to work with people. I learned how to lead people. I learned how to communicate. I was screwing up along the way. But it was better to screw up along the way while you're in college learning those things than to screw up once you graduate and now are getting paid to do that well, right? So college is a great place to sort of explore those things. And you can also kind of learn about yourself. What are you good at? What are you not so good at? What do you need to work on for your future? So 
Extracurricular are vital, absolutely vital for your future to round you out to create your whole person that you're going to bring to the table when you eventually graduate. Fantastic question. Yes, sir. Hi, guys. I'm Shoy, and I'm from Bard Early College, Queens. So you talked. <laughs> So you talked about in your presentation about how this year is the 100 year anniversary of NASA, I think? NASA Langley, yes. What do you assume is going to happen after the next 100 years? What do you hope? Oh, fun. What's going to happen in the next 100 years? You know what? You're going to have a chance to help create that, right? So that's what's really exciting. So what are you dreaming about that you can bring to NASA, right? Every one of you has an idea that I don't have. Right, and so I hope you embrace that. You guys have ideas that I'm not even thinking about and that nobody at NASA is thinking about. So I hope you join us and help us create that. But what are some of the things on the horizon? What is gonna happen is we're gonna have humans on another planet. We're gonna have a habitat on the moon where we'll be living and working on the moon. What will also happen is unmanned airplanes will be used more and more in our society, not just to deliver Amazon packages, but to deliver people in different places, to help us rescue people during natural disasters will become more common. Satellites will be used more and more to help us advance our communication capabilities, to better be able to nail and navigate through major weather disasters will be a part of our future. Phones will continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller so we can communicate with ease with even smaller devices. There's so many opportunities that will be coming along in our future. We've just begun to explore. And so what a fabulous question. I would encourage you to go to nasa.gov. You can see some of our images of the future about what might be possible going forward. I love your question. I love the creativity. Fantastic. Who, where are you going? Hi right there. Hi there, in the front. Okay. Hi. Hi. I'm from University Heights. Okay. Hello. Um, was there ever a time while you was working at NASA that you felt like intimidated or that you couldn't contribute to like research or a project? Oh yes, goodness gracious. You mean this week or last week? <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, oh yeah. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons I work at NASA. I love having hard problems. I love challenges, right? Uh, it's part of what's exciting about it. Does it also mean sometimes it's, like, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming? Sure. But you know what? You guys face that too. Those of you who raised your hands earlier when I asked if you were in sports, you faced that before, right? You go meet a team that's the best in the, in the, in the area, right? And you got you to gotta game up, right? And those of you who are in the, the arts, you have faced other artists that were far better than you that you were intimidated to work with, right? And you got to get out there and do the best you possibly can. So yeah, absolutely. There have been multiple, on a regular basis, right? But that's often what's also inspirational, right? If, you, if you're an artist and you were never challenged to do something you'd never tried before, it would get kind of boring. And you'd probably stop playing that instrument, drawing, you're not going to draw the same picture every single time. You're going to step out and to draw to a new medium of art, right? So yes, at NASA, absolutely, I have challenges where I'm like, wow, I don't know how I'm going to solve that. <laughs> Especially when I first started at NASA, you know, I, I, I somehow thought everybody else knew everything, and it was just me that felt this way, right? I, I really did. And I, I had to have mentors that, that reminded me, um, no, the rest of us are figuring this out too. We're just willing to work together. And then what I realized is that fire in their eyes. They're like, no, this is brand new. There's no book on this. But are you willing to work with us on this? We're going to give it a shot. You know, I remember one of my, uh, my, my, my first and only flight test program, a very high risk program, never, ever, ever had been done before. And I've been out of my career a lot, so I was at a point where I could embrace, right, something that was really challenging. So uh, the person that I was working with and I, um, and uh, we went to talk to our director, and he, he sat us both down and he said, and I, I just need an honest answer here. What are the odds of this program working out well? I mean, you, you, you got like tw two years, you don't have enough money, never been done before. How on earth are you going to get this working out? And do, you, do you really think this is going to work? I thought about it and I said, 
sir, uh, actually, there's a good chance it probably won't work, actually. Um, never been done before. I, I really can't guarantee you it's all going to work out right. I think it's a really cool program. We're going to learn a whole lot of stuff. I'm really not sure about that, right? And then um, he asked the person working with me the same question. He said the same thing. Yeah, I'm not sure this is going to work out. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's a really cool model idea, a really cool opportunity to do something different. And then he, he paused and said, okay, are you guys game? And we both said, heck yeah, let's go, right? I mean, we were both so excited to give it a shot, even though it was likely that we would have challenges. So we stepped up into that, let's go. I'm ready to give it a shot, right? And so, yeah, that's part of the fun, though. If it was easy, somebody else would have done it. That's why they hired us, right? All right, another question. Over here on the right side. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Alex from Fordham Prep, and um, Hello. I know that NASA works primarily in space travel and uh, aeronautics and all that stuff, but has NASA developed any underwater technologies? Oh, how interesting. Great question. Does NASA develop any underwater technology? So we don't focus a lot on, on the underwater things. However, you know, water is just another fluid right, and to air. So many of the things we develop for air, by the way, for the school that's leaving, it was great to have you guys here. Have a blessed day. Thank you for the honor of talking to you this morning. Um, so water is more viscous, was what we would call. Um, it's more dense than air. So in the equations that you look at for fluid mechanics, you would change those parameters. And you can often take what you would learn about in the air and use them in the sea and underwater. And with that in mind, you know, the riblets that were created for aircraft are, have been used to make sailing vessels that are incredibly fast. Um, a NASA scientist that I had the, the blessing of working with, he helped design the Speedo suit that ended up shattering swimming records using what he learned in the air. So though we don't directly work in underwater um, research, we do collaborate with others who are doing work in that area to apply what we've learned in air. What a great question. Very insightful. Dr. McGill, I think we have room for maybe one more question. Okay, one more question. Thank you guys for being here. Last question, last question. Um, yes, sir. I'm from Bard. <laughs> My question is, what percentage of NASA is government funded? What is that number and is it a profitable organization? Uh, that's a good question. All of NASA is government funded. We are a federal organization, just like the Pentagon, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Homeland Security. We're a federal. My badge looks like any other federal employee. So we're 100% government funded. Absolutely. Um, our budget, I do not remember. I want to say, I'm going to, it's in the... 13-ish billion dollar a year budget. It's actually a very small fraction of the U.S.'s uh, budget uh, for research and advancement. So yes, we are wholly government. And actually, it's one of the reasons I enjoy working there. Our bottom line isn't to make money. Our bottom line is to advance space, aeronautics, and earth science for the betterment of the United States of America. That includes me being here and supporting and encouraging education across our country. Great question. Do you think okay. we have? I think we're. I think we're out of time. Actually, we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. It was Let's a thank to Dr. Be here. McGowan. Just remember, people, that all breakthrough comes through curiosity and not formula, and that's what you have to uh, develop in yourself. And also, for those of you who um, have said that you've been bullied or or that violence has been part of all of our lives. Um, Dr. Lafayette will be here on April 9th, and we're talking about having students, having you form a student committee for nonviolence so that you could take care of each other, so that things like what just happened recently with the shootings can happen less or 
stop happening. And we're actually, in addition to the event that Jose talked about on April 9th at St. Bartholomew, we're talking about an event up here in the Bronx where, um, where Dr. Lafayette will, will be speaking to you and working with you because he's worked in prisons of Medellin and all over the world. He'd been invited by drug lords <laughs> from Colombia to teach them how to uh, deal with violence. So anyways, um, without further ado, I, I, I thank you all for being here. Can I want to just address that whole violence issue. Yeah. You know, you have a choice here. You absolutely have a choice. There are so many problems that need to get solved in our world, right here in New York City. Why would you put your energy into something that is so negative, right? So you as students can say, I'm not gonna be a part of this, 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 or this. This does not help me, it doesn't help society. You can choose to change the world around you, one interaction at a time. You can either escalate the violence or you can reduce the violence. And I firmly believe that love covers over a multitude of sins. And so when someone comes at you with bullying or someone comes at you with drugs, you walk away, number one. And number two, where can you infuse love and kindness around you to help create the society that you want to live in? You have that opportunity. You don't have to be a part of what's negative around you, and you can change your world, one person at a time. And that's why space is so exciting because there is no conflict in space. You have co you can have co co collaboration, cooperation, Absolutely. not just among you, but among countries. Again, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day.